Sup, Chooms? How y'all living? Hope everything is nova and that you're all having a preem week and that 2022 has been a preem year for you so far. Anyways, on this channel, everybody knows that we've gone balls deep many times about why DHT is a trash hormone. The evidence is overwhelmingly clear that even though DHT plays some important roles during maturation, in adulthood, DHT is a universally harmful and reviled hormone that has a negative impact on our overall quality of life. DHT, what it is, it's a potent metabolite of testosterone that is created via the 5-alpha reductase enzyme, also known as the 5-AR enzyme. But as it exists naturally in our body, serum levels of DHT are far too low for it to have any effect outside of the scalp, prostate, and skin, where of course it only does bad things like giving us acne, making it hard to take a piss by enlarging our prostate, and of course causing hair loss. Furthermore, there is even strong evidence that DHT can reduce the lifespan of men by accelerating the progression of heart disease, and I did a video about that recently, which I'll go ahead and link below in case you haven't seen it yet. The bottom line, though, is that DHT is an unnecessary, inconvenient, and even a dangerous hormone, and suppressing it is an easy way to improve our overall health, longevity, as well as our quality of life. Yet, for some reason, despite all the well-documented dangers associated with dihydrogen, hydrotestosterone DHT production, there seems to be almost a cult of personality around DHT. There are even online communities like the Ray Pete forums who outright deny that DHT plays a role in hair loss and instead suggest that you can treat hair loss by taking an aspirin and drinking sweet orange juice. And then of course you have groups like the Propecia Health Forums and the PFS Network who act like DHT is so important that even taking a very weak 5-AR inhibitor like saw palmetto can cause permanent erectile dysfunction, even though saw palmetto has never even proven itself more effective than placebo at treating androgenic alopecia. DHT, for all of its faults, still has more simps than any other hormone produced by the body, and even though very few people take any of these DHT simps seriously, there still are a lot of misconceptions about the importance, or lack of importance in this case, of DHT, in particular how it relates to neurological health as well as sexual health. Now, I have already gone over the role of DHT and 5-AR inhibitors in regards to neurological health, and I'll post that video below, but today I'd like to take a nice, long, and firm look at the common belief that DHT is important for sexual health. In particular, I'd like to see if DHT plays an important role in promoting libido and proper erectile function. Now, to be clear, I am not denying that finasteride has a very, very small possibility of causing some sexual side effects. I know this because in the clinical trials done on finasteride, subjects who were on finasteride had a slightly higher risk of developing sexual side effects compared to placebo, but we also know that that these side effects can often be mitigated through titration adjustments, such as using 0.5 or 0.25 milligrams daily or every other day as opposed to one milligram daily. And I talk about this in my optimal dosage of finasteride video, which I'll link below in case you haven't seen it. We also know that the research confirms that even if you do get side effects from finasteride, that the side effects will usually go away even with continued use and that they will always go away with discontinuation. There is no such thing as persistent sexual side effects or persistent side effects at all with finasteride use. When you stop using the drug, the side effects go away 100% of the time. So finasteride, it's obviously an extremely effective and very well tolerated drug that can be used by virtually anybody. Even if the person using it doesn't respond well to the one milligram per day dose, they can always adjust it as I already discussed. But in the very few people who do get sexual side effects, the question is, is it simply a linear equation of lower DHT equals a greater chance of side effects? Well, we know that finasteride suppresses serum DHT levels by about 60%, yet sexual side effects are still extremely rare. On the other hand, if you were to suppress, say, 60% of testosterone in men, then 100% of men would get side effects. So clearly, DHT is no substitute for testosterone. But the question is, does it play any role whatsoever in sexual function at all? Well, let's 
find out, Chooms. Let's take a look at an article published in 2008 titled, quote, The Effect of 5A Reductase Inhibitors on Erectile Function, unquote. This is an article that addresses exactly the question that we are concerned with today, namely the question as to whether blocking the 5AR enzyme and lowering DHT levels has any bad effect on sexual function. This is a review article that looks at all the animal and human research on the subject, and the few articles on the subject published since then haven't really changed anything, so we'll concentrate on this review article here for now. So... Animal research on sexual function can be interesting from a theoretical point of view, but oftentimes animal research is misleading because different species react differently to sex hormones, and also because often researchers give animals much higher doses of drugs than humans take, so sometimes the results aren't that applicable to humans. However, human research is harder to do because of ethical concerns, which sadly researchers don't seem to care about as much when it concerns animals. But if we are concerned about what affects the five AR enzyme and DHT levels have on humans, sometimes the most enlightening experiments are those that Mother Nature herself performs. For ethical reasons, we can't give babies or young children 5AR blockers, obviously, to see what role DHT plays in their development, but we can look at what happens to people who are born with a genetic deficit in their 5AR enzymes to see what happens to them when they grow up with very, very low levels of DHT. This is what an article published way back in 1970 described. The authors of this study found 13 families in a particular village in the Dominican Republic with children who were born and raised as girls. But during adolescence, they developed male genitalia and surprise, surprise, it turns out these girls were actually boys. They had normal male muscle development, normal male sex organs, and their voices changed just like any other adolescent. But curiously, they had scant to no body hair or beards as well as no acne. They had small prostate glands and more importantly of all though they never went bald if you follow my channel or read about the effects of dht in adolescence you would immediately recognize that these boys were missing something and that something they were missing was dht sure enough when the affected subjects were studied they had very low dht levels and were found to be lacking 5 ar enzyme activity Specifically, they had a DHT levels that were about 10 times lower than DHT levels in normal men, and they were converting only about 1% of their testosterone into DHT versus in normal men, which is about 10% of testosterone, which is converted into DHT. So based on this study, it is clear that DHT is most important during fetal development because without it, male genitalia are absent during childhood. However, and this was really surprising to me, it turns out that DHT really isn't that important during adolescents either because in these boys lacking the 5AR enzyme they still developed a normal penis and scrotum and they have normal muscular development and deepening of their voices. It looks like it is testosterone and not DHT that causes all these changes during adolescence and that is why contrary to popular belief it is okay for teenagers to use 5AR inhibitors and that is why many young men do use finasteride successfully with no issues to their development. Most importantly though is that after adolescence these men with 5AR deficiency and very low levels of DHT had normal libidos and sexual function just like men who have normal 5AR levels. So it doesn't look like based on this data that DHT is important at all for sexual function. What's important for sexual function instead is the alpha red pill chad hormone testosterone and not the beta blue pilled virgin bitch hormone DHT. Of course the other important concept to come out of the study is that men with low DHT levels do not develop male pattern baldness. And from this observation came the idea that male pattern baldness was due to DHT and that 5AR blockers like finasteride and dutasteride would turn out to be useful in treating androgenic alopecia. Of course, this theory was tested and later confirmed to be 100% accurate, which is why so many men benefit from 5AR blockers today. So ever since this landmark study of men with with 5AR deficiency, researchers have been trying to figure out more precisely what role DHT has in sexual function if 
indeed it has any function at all. This brings us to the animal studies I talked about, and as we'll see, animal studies have some conflicting results. Most of the animal studies are done in castrated male animals, so that these animals have nearly absent testosterone and DHT levels, and then the researchers give these poor animals testosterone or DHT, as well as a 5-AR blocker or an aromatase blocker inhibitor, aromatase inhibitor blocker, I should say, which blocks the conversion of testosterone into estradiol. So by manipulating the sex hormones in this way, researchers can try to determine which sex hormones are most important for sexual function, but these experiments are pretty artificial, and like I said, the results have not been consistent. For example, in 1981, a study was published where castrated rats were given testosterone alone, which did not restore erectile function in these rats. But adding dihydrotestosterone, DHT, did in fact restore erectile function. So this particular study seemed to suggest that DHT was important for erectile function, at least when you're dealing with rat penises. However, a subsequent study published in 1983 suggested the opposite conclusion. This was done in castrated ferrets, and the ferrets were given various combinations of testosterone, DHT, aromatase blockers, and 5-AR blockers. After administering the testosterone to the male ferrets, the researcher said, quote, significantly more neck gripping, mounting, and pelvic thrusting than control females, unquote. However, the study also said, quote, after DHT, little masculine sexual behavior was shown by any group, unquote. So in this study, DHT didn't do a damn thing for sexual function. Rather, the study authors felt that the effect of sexual function was totally a result of testosterone in the brain and that both estrogen and DHT had little effect on sexual function, at least in these particular ferrets, I guess you could say. This brings up the issue that erectile function requires not just a normal mechanism in the genitalia, but also that a lot of sexual activity has neural logical components in the brain and that sex hormones have effects both locally in the penis and in the central nervous system. However, keep in mind that the major hormone circulating within the blood of men is testosterone and not DHT. DHT tends to have local effects where it's produced, namely in the prostate, the skin, as well as the hair follicles, and it tends to not have systemic effects, whereas testosterone predominantly does have systemic effects remote from where it's produced in the body, which of course is the testicles. Other animal studies, though, have suggested suggested that DHT may play a role in erectile function. Again, looking at castrated rats, a study from 1995 showed that both testosterone and DHT restored erectile function in rats, but testosterone plus finasteride failed to restore erectile function, suggesting that conversion of testosterone into DHT was a necessary step in order to preserve erectile function. A similar study published in 1999 looked at the levels of nitric oxide synthase, also known as no. Yes! Anyways, this study looked at NOS in castrated rats after testosterone or DHT. Nitric oxide is not just a plot device from the Fast and Furious franchise, it is also a vasodilator and is thought to be an important component for erectile function. So again, both testosterone and DHT restored erectile function and NOS levels in these castrated rats, but the effects of testosterone were negated by finasteride use. So these two rat studies have opposite findings from the ferret study in that DHT DHT looks like it is critical, at least for rat sex. Other studies have looked at microscopic structural changes in the penises of castrated rats and a lot of fibrosis, meaning scar tissue, was found in the penises of these castrated rats. There were similar changes of fibrosis seen, though less severe, in finasteride-treated rats who hadn't been castrated. So, looking at this research, one has to ask themselves, can a lack of DHT cause changes in the penis that could lead to erectile dysfunction? Well, before we start getting too worried, let's get back to the studies done on actual human human beings. In 1995, a study was done looking at erections that occurred during sleep in 20 men who were on 5 milligrams per day of finasteride for 12 weeks versus placebo. Keep in mind, 5 milligrams is 5 times higher than the standard 1 milligram dose for hair loss. So, in this particular study done on humans, finasteride did not suppress nocturnal erections. So, with this study, things are really looking up for finasteride so far, as well as erections. Another study from 1999 compared a synthetic androgen that is not converted to DHT versus testosterone on erectile dysfunction in 20 men who were hypogonadal, meaning they had low testosterone. Both testosterone and the 
synthetic hormone improved erectile function, implying DHT wasn't necessary for sexual function. And while we're on the subject of synthetic androgens, it is worth bringing up the synthetic androgen known as mesterolone, which is also goes by the trade name of Proveron, of course. And this is a derivative of DHT. Theoretically, this androgen is supposed to be used in men with testosterone deficiency or low testosterone. And the fact is, is that if you have low testosterone, any androgen will improve your libido, whether it's testosterone, DHT, or some synthetic androgen even. On the other hand, Proveron is also used often by bodybuilders as an anabolic steroid, and like any other anabolic steroid, it can increase libido. But just because a substance derived from DHT and given at much higher doses than the amount of DHT normally present in the body can increase libido, that doesn't mean that decreasing the physiological levels of DHT in your body with 5-AR blockers would decrease your libido as well. On the contrary, many people report raised libido on finasteride, and that is likely due to the fact that since finasteride blocks the 5-AR enzyme, it thus raises testosterone since less testosterone gets wasted by converting into the trash hormone DHT. Another interesting piece of research I brought up on my channel before, but I think is worth repeating here, is a research paper by Mondani that was published in 2007 that talked about the fictitious fake QAnon conspiracy theory known as post-finasteride syndrome. Anyways, what this study did is that it examined the nocebo effect on users of finasteride. So the nocebo effect, for those who don't know, it's like the placebo effect, except instead of the placebo effect making you feel better, the nocebo effect will make you feel worse. The nocebo effect is what happens when you expect the drug will cause a side effect. That side effect is more likely to occur for psychological reasons rather than for any actual physiological reasons. So Mondani and his fellow researchers prescribed finasteride to two groups of men. In one group, they just prescribed the drug without mentioning any possible sexual side effects. But the other group, they counseled the subjects about possible side effects. This counsel ended up significantly increasing the reported incidence of sexual side effects from 9.6% of the group without counseling to a whopping 30.9% in the group who were counseled. Thus, the nocebo effect is very powerful and very real with finasteride and it is even more powerful nowadays because of all the widespread presence of fear-mongering and bro science online. And I know all this too well because when I was first introduced to finasteride, the information I got from the drug came entirely from online hair loss forums where 99% of the content was fear-mongering and misinformation. And since I, I wasn't as well read about the subject of finasteride as I am today, I sadly believed this crap and gave myself a nocebo effect. You know, I remember I would take even, uh, or I'd have instances where I'd just take one pill and then I think I would have sexual dysfunction just one or two minutes later, which is impossible since the drug doesn't work that quickly. And then I would stay off the drug for months at a time thinking it was dangerous only for me to take it again out of desperation. And then the nocebo effect kept repeating itself, it was a vicious cycle that lasted for years, and it wasn't until I became better educated and read the actual medical research about the drug and better learned to interpret research that I realized that these apparent side effects I was experiencing were not in fact coming from the drug, but rather they were coming from me. They were completely psychosomatic, and once I had accepted that, I realized that the drug was completely safe, and I had wasted years of my life being afraid, and it cost me my hairline that I had to spend over $10,000 restoring through hair restoration surgery. Had I just listened to my doctor and never went on these terrible hair loss forums, I could have avoided all of this. And needless to say, it's something I'm still pretty pissed off about even almost a decade later. But anyways... <clears throat> Anyways, getting back to the subject at hand, there does seem to be a discrepancy between the human studies and the animal studies when it comes to the importance of DHT on sexual health. The authors of the review article felt that the sum of this discrepancy can be explained by the fact that in the studies done on animals, the DHT levels were either normal or zero, while on humans, 5-AR blockers don't completely block the conversion of testosterone into, into DHT, especially in the local tissues. Not even do tasteride completely blocks the conversion of testosterone into DHT. Not only that, even if you completely block the 5-AR enzyme, there are still backdoor pathways for DHT creation that doesn't involve the 5-AR enzyme at all. So even if theoretically there is use for a tiny amount of DHT in the human body, you will still produce enough of it. So even if you are completely suppressing the 5-AR enzyme, Time, there will still be enough uh, uh, DHT lingering around that it won't be a big deal. But anyways, 
Back to the animal studies, they are pretty artificial and don't reflect the reality of the situation of men on low doses of finasteride for androgenic alopecia. I mean, if DHT were really crucial for sexual function, the rates of erectile dysfunction would be a lot higher than just a few percentage points. But on that note, you may be asking yourself, but Kevin, if DHT isn't important, then why do some people who take finasteride get side effects? I mean, surely it has to have some use then, right? Well, the studies don't completely rule out the possibility that DHT DHT plays some role in erectile function, at least in some men, but it's important to remember that in the mechanism behind finasteride sexual side effects, it is not fully understood why it happens. It's highly possible that the increased estrogen levels created by blocking 5-AR, which increases testosterone and thus shunts more testosterone into the aromatase pathway, this may play a role as to why some people get side effects. It's because of higher estrogen levels. It's also clear that there is a big nocebo effect behind finasteride and many people who go online to seek information about 5AR blockers get exposed to a tremendous amount of pseudoscientific fear-mongering bro science garbage and, mis and, and misinformation so some of that propaganda from online communities that people get exposed to may in fact cause erectile dysfunction from psychological issues rather than due to any physical changes in the human body also a lot of the studies showing higher incidence of sexual side effects with finasteride were studies done on men taking finasteride for enlarged prostates. And these are older men who are more likely to have sexual problems to begin with due to their advanced age and their prostate disease as well. In the studies that use finasteride for androgenic alopecia though, the incidence of sexual side effects is very, very low. And I cover this in detail in my video on finasteride side effects, which I made recently and I'll link below in case you haven't seen it. So anyways, <clears throat> After reviewing all this data, the authors of the review article concluded, quote, in this review article, we summarize the effects of 5-AR inhibitors with respect to erectile function. It is likely that androgens are vital for the development, maintenance, and function of penile tissue and regulation of erectile physiology. However, the critical androgenic substance for these effects is most likely testosterone rather than DHT, unquote. So you heard that. It is clear that in adults, it is testosterone, which is the important sex hormone. And DHT, once again, proves itself to be a useless trash hormone, just hanging around, causing a whole bunch of trouble for the human body. There is little to, little to fear from suppressing this trash hormone, but there is, in fact, a lot to gain from suppressing it. Suppressing DHT is not only crucial for stopping hair loss, but it is also one of the easiest ways to prolong our longevity as well as our well-being due to its benefits for cardiovascular and prostate health. Now, you may think it's preposterous that a hormone that our body produces naturally can possibly cause harm. I mean, how could millions of years of evolution not eliminate such an obvious genetic flaw? Well, it turns out there is an interesting concept in biology known as the antagonistic pleiotrophy hypothesis. Essentially, this concept boils down to that there are some genes or genetic traits that are useful early in life but are detrimental later in life. This hypothesis explains why some bad genetic diseases don't just die out from natural selection. For example, Huntington's disease is a genetic neurological disease that causes movement problems in dementia. But these problems only arise after when people get older, generally past the reproductive age. But the same genes that cause Huntington's disease also seem to cause a lower rate of cancer, interestingly enough. So these genes provide a survival advantage that increases the chances of reproduction and passing along the genes. Now, I can't really apply this concept for the genes that lead to androgenic alopecia because I can't think of any survival advantage advantage from hair loss, but I do think you can imagine that the presence of DHT is analogous to the concept of antagonistic pleiotrophy. DHT is a testosterone amplifier that binds more readily to androgen receptors and is more potent than testosterone, and it clearly has a critical role during fetal development in that it causes differentiation of the sex organs. It has some role in adolescence as well, such as causing growth of beard and body hair, but we know from the studies on men who lack this 5-AR enzyme that other sexual characteristics that developed during puberty, such as maturation of sex organs, muscle development, and deepening of the voice, these are just really testosterone-dependent characteristics. You know, after puberty, DHT really is just a trash hormone giving us enlarged prostates and making us go bald. The bulk of the research on DHT and sexual function implies that DHT is not important for libido or erectile function, at least in the vast majority of men who take 5-AR blockers like finasteride or dutasteride. So, let's not kid ourselves here, Chu testosterone is the main male hormone that makes us strong and virile. DHT, on the other hand, is just a shitty metabolite of testosterone that really should be seen as 
as an old man hormone, as all it does past puberty is cause conditions that are associated with aging, such as hair loss, enlarged prostate, and even heart disease. Now, it is true that higher testosterone is correlated with higher DHT levels, as if you have more testosterone, you'll likely have more of its worthless metabolite, DHT. But thanks to the invention of five AR inhibitors like uh, finasteride and dutasteride, we now have the option of having all the glorious benefits of testosterone without having to suffer the horrendous consequences of DHT in our body. DHT is nothing more than a cancerous tumor. The longer you leave it unchecked in your body, the worse things are going to get for you. Now, Thanks to the existence of 5 air inhibitors like finasteride, we can safely excise that tumor while leaving our glorious testosterone in check and even raising it slightly. So even though finasteride is a hair loss treatment, it is much, much more than that. It is also a testosterone preserver that improves the quality of our life in every single imaginable respect. With aging comes a natural decline in testosterone and an increased risk in developing heart disease. And finasteride has been shown to counteract both of these effects in a safe and efficacious manner. So DHT is basically nothing more than just the endocrinological equivalent to a twitch thought. When you first hear about it, it might seem enticing and may seem like it has a lot to offer if you give into it, but at the end of the day, it is little more than fool's gold that will strip you of your dignity and will take from you everything and leave you as nothing more than an empty emasculated shell of your former self while you continue to simp for it in absolute futility. So for the love of Christ, people, don't be a DHT simp. Take your finasteride, save your hair, save your masculinity, prolong your life, and get on with your life. And with that, good luck on the path, my fellow hair loss witchers. God bless.